The story or stories you are about to hear are to entertain. The writers of these stories may claim they are true, yet they may not be. That is up to you to decide. After all, this world is a strange one. Canada is as friendly as it is cold, but lurking within the vast swaths of green forests and snowy landscapes lie creatures that defy explanation. Creatures with a taste for blood and maple syrup. Get ready. These stories are chilling and terrifying. Enjoy these tales of people who have encountered bizarre Canadian monsters. If you have a story of your own, I'd love to narrate it. Share it with us at darkstories.org. I'm looking for scary stories from Africa. Now, let's begin. Something Tried to Destroy Me From Freddy Aluminum I'm an Australian guy living in British Columbia, Canada. I moved in October of 2019 just to have a bit of an adventure. I had never seen snow before, so I had been looking forward to this up-and-coming season all year. I now work for a ski resort in the middle of nowhere. Well, nowhere as far as you're concerned. I won't say where, but the mountains are giant and gorgeous, covered in snow-dusted trees for months on end and beyond cold. It was completely different to the heat of southeast Queensland. The snow can get up to six feet deep here on occasion, so I've had to learn all the rules most Canadians have imprinted on them since birth. Don't walk under icicles. Don't walk home drunk. Don't leave trash out, etc. The colder parts of Canada can be really dangerous, but I never once expected I would have such a horrifying encounter with something that I cannot explain. It was only a few days back. It had just snowed very heavily the night before. I'm talking 70 to 80 centimeters on top of the fresh snow already on the ground. If you don't know what that's like, it's scary. You can walk right up to second-story windows in some cases. These are serious amounts of snow. I had been drinking that day with some buddies in the village when I decided to turn in for the night. It must have been minus 17 degrees Celsius outside, but I was so drunk I barely felt the wind and breeze at all. To get home, I have to walk through a small woodland area for about 15 minutes, very dense with trees, it is super dark even in daylight, so at night, I had to use my phone torch, and I was stumbling through the knee-deep snow coating the small walking track. I could only see a few feet in front of me, and I could only see the outlines of the surrounding trees. I was ten minutes in when I stopped, hearing something. I strained my ears to listen more closely. It sounded like a little girl saying, Help. It was a soft and fearful voice, somewhere off in the trees to my right. I called back with a hello, pointing my phone torch in the direction of the soft voice. Who's there? I called out. Please, help me. The voice whined. I've hurt my legs. A sound of choking back tears is faintly heard. Now I've seen enough movies and read enough stories to know that following voices into the trees is a bad idea, but there was something about this voice. It sounded so genuine, so frightened, as if a little girl was just outside the range of my vision, freezing to death in the snow. So of course I don't stand and do nothing. I call out again. Hey, uh, can you walk? Where are you? I can come get you. I began turning around in the snow, plowing closer to the edge of the walking track, torch searching through the wall of tall pine trees. I keep edging when I spot a small figure, just close enough to see her silhouette. She was peeking out from behind a nearby pine tree. Hey, don't be afraid. I spoke to her softly, bending down closer. Suddenly, my eyes met hers, and immediately I realized something wasn't right. Now, they weren't glowing or anything like that, 
but I can't quite explain it well. Her eyes were milky, like spider's eyes, like they were alive, but they had nothing within them. They seemed soulless. I leaned in closer to the base of the pine tree, maybe three meters away from me, when suddenly I got too close. I fell face first into the snow. Those of you who spend time in places that have heavy snow probably know what happened. I forgot the most important rule of all, plunging headfirst into the deepest tree well I had ever seen. I was immediately engulfed in a powder snow, tipped further upside down. As I slipped in deeply, I could hear a high-pitched cackle of a female voice. I tried to breathe and scream, but snow forced itself into my mouth. I began to choke and writhe. I was panicking, trying to spin around and find my bearings, kicking out and finding something to grab. As I freaked out, I felt myself slip further down, only making my emotions worse. The snow collapsed around me, making a dense compact, holding my feet above my head and making it harder to move. I was still choking on snow. My head was pounding from all the blood being pulled downwards. A scary thought kept going through my mind, that this might be the end of my story. I knew I wasn't getting out of this one. My vision began to blur, and my movements became more and more sapping, when all of a sudden, I felt a hand grab me by my jacket, wrenching me out of there and into freedom. I gasped in the crisp alpine and heaved on the ground, tears streaming down my face. I looked up and saw one of my mates, Fraser, breathing heavily. Turns out he had seen me fall into the snow, sprinting 30 meters in deep powder to help me back out. This man had saved my life. As I pulled my mess of a self back together, he asked me what the bloody hell I was thinking, walking into the wilderness in the middle of the night drunk. But I had to tell him about the girl first. I tried to point out where she had been standing, but she wasn't anywhere to be seen. What's more, there weren't any tracks at all in the snow leading away from the pine tree, just the mere hole that I'd made. I don't know what she was, that inhuman little girl, but it tried to have me drowned. If it wasn't for my mate, I sure would have been dead. I hope one day I can get over this experience, but for now, it seems I have dreams of her often. Dreams of what would have happened if Frazier was only a few minutes late. What was she? If you have an answer, I'd love to know. North Saskatchewan River Creature from Succulent.Coral I'm from a very small town in Saskatchewan, Canada. I've lived here all my life, and I've never seen anything too abnormal until this year. It was only after hearing that you were looking for Canadian stories that I decided to finally speak up about my experiences. Almost every weekend, my friend Erica and I always go to the ski hill near here and work on our snowboarding skills. We usually go around 2 p.m., so we have about two hours to snowboard before it gets too dark and cold out, since the sun usually sets around 4 here in the winter. A couple of months ago, we were doing this very thing and had a good day. The ski hill is about an hour from our town, so by the time we had finished, which was about 3.45 p.m., it was starting to get dim. We hopped into my little car and started the drive back. About 45 minutes later, we were getting close to home, and it was already pretty dark outside. Our town is kind of in the middle of nowhere, and everyone in Canada knows Saskatchewan is very barren and flat, so it was a very vast, remote area, and no one was on the highway. The roads were bad that night due to fast winds, so we had to slow down a lot on the highway, which was giving both of us anxiety. The two of us were 17 and have never gotten into an accident before, 
nor had we ever wanted to, of course. At one point, there was a very snowy part of the vacant highway, and we had to slow down even more. That's when a figure leapt out onto the road and stopped just at the edge of my headlight's reach. Erica screamed, and I gasped, holding my breath as I slammed onto the brakes. This caused us to fishtail. I barely managed to regain control of the vehicle, but we came to a stop just in front of the figure. I immediately looked at it, and at first glance I truly thought it was just a deer. But as I took in more detail, it looked all wrong. It was massive. I've seen deer around here many times before, too many to count, and I live in a hunting community, so I just knew this wasn't any normal deer from around here. It had long limbs, and its antlers were huge. But not only were its limbs long, they were just so disfigured, it seemed painful. It's hard to explain, but it just looked injured. I wasn't sure how it leapt in front of us with ease and grace like it had. And like any normal deer around here would do at the sight of a vehicle, I expected the thing to run back into the ditch or something, but it just stood there, not moving a muscle. Everything about the situation felt so wrong, and yes, I know deer can be captivated in headlights and not move, but this creature... It showed no signs of fear. It didn't even look to be breathing. It simply stared at us with cold, unblinking eyes. Its whole presence just felt evil, life-threatening even. Its bones were jutting out from everywhere under its skin. Some parts even looked to be decayed. Erica and I didn't say a word. We couldn't look away from it. After what seemed like a few minutes, it just walked off. Not running or frolicking, it just walked, calmly, back into the ditch in the opposite direction it had come from. It then disappeared on the other side of the transcan. The two of us exchanged shaky looks, and she was the first to say a word at all. What the hell was that? She said. But... I didn't really know what to tell her. We talked about it on the rest of the way home and decided maybe it was just a weird, intense, injured deer. Definitely a first around here. Both of us do believe that some cryptids exist, but I think it was for our own sanity that we explained this away somehow, you know? I thought that would be it. Thought that I'd never see it again. Unfortunately, I was wrong. About a week ago, my dad and I were playing around and exploring on our ski just up by the North Saskatchewan River, and we had just gotten down to the bank to see if the ice was thick enough to ride on. My dad drove his ski down first to test it, and soon came back up onto the bank to ask if I wanted to try the ice. I refused, since I was still very new to this, and I didn't want to try it yet. He agreed and we decided to go along the bank more, exploring a bit further. We soon came to some thicker trees and pines when we began to smell something a little off. It wasn't very powerful, but it also just smelled really bad. It was clearly something rotting, but we were in a snowy area where everything was supposed to smell clean. My dad went a little further ahead than me, and I thought maybe it was just a skunk, something normal. I went on ahead after him, following my dad's tracks, watching the trees a bit, and that's when I saw it again, that same creature walking in the same direction I was headed. It was pretty far back in the trees, but you could still tell how massive it was from that distance. All the features from the two months before were still present, if not a little more, worsened. It didn't do anything but walk, fading into the deep and thicker trees in a weird waddle sort of fashion, and I haven't seen it since. Erica and I have told our closest friends about this, and I don't think they believe us, but I really want to know what it is. 
I do know a basic amount of things about cryptids. But maybe this is some kind of normal or mutant deer or something. Uh, who knows? Even if there's a normal explanation, it's terrifying. I've no idea if I should be concerned, or just continue to try to tell myself it's a weird mutated deer, as if that makes me feel any better. Three in the morning, from descendant from a family of shaman. I'm from the northwest of Ontario, Canada. My reserve is called Kachinamakusip Aninawak, also known as People by the Lake in our native language. It is said we are the third largest community up north of Ontario. That being said, we have different areas, such as downtown and West Bay. Both are on the island and the land is connected by a long stretched road. Across that is the creek and mainland area. I lived in West Bay at the time, coming back from town. I had finished visiting with friends earlier in the night. I was ready to get home. I left their house in town around 2.30. By the time I arrived at the main road intersection, it was about three. There's a main road that goes around the reservation, and there are roads connecting to it, the first of which is called Chiefsfield Road. Now, the entire time I'd been walking, I had not seen another person out, nor had I seen a vehicle on the road, for that matter. As I was passing Chiefsfield Road, I felt a sensation in my gut, like someone was watching me. Sure enough, when I glanced up that road, I saw a figure wearing a dark black hood. They seemed to be staring in my direction, I was feeling friendly, so I called out to them. Hey, you got a smoke? I was having a craving. I did not receive a response, so I continued walking. But I paid close attention to the sounds around me, making sure I knew whether that person was about to move. Sure enough, as I walked on, I could hear them walking after me, quickly and stumbling, like they were drunk and were looking for a fight. I stopped at the bottom of the road and glanced back. That figure seemed to be following me. I turned to continue walking, and sure enough, the footsteps only got faster, catching up to me. I stopped on three more occasions, and after a time, when I glanced back, it stopped. We both stood there, seemingly staring at each other. I got mad and swore at the figure, threatening to fight if they didn't stop. But it was then that I saw its face. There was just enough light to make out that its skin was all black, like solid nighttime black. I wanted to speak again, but it spoke instead, saying the same threats to me in the same manner and same voice. It walked a little bit closer, soon revealing more of itself from a nearby light. It was like I was looking in a mirror, its face was like mine, but completely black. What I was looking at wasn't actually human. I was certain of it. It was some sort of spirit or creature, something evil. I took off towards some street lights. I made it maybe 10 feet in the middle of the lights, and I stopped to look back to see if this thing would follow me, but it just stood there at the edge. I called out, asking it what it was, telling it to come into the light. I needed to see more of it. I needed to see if I could understand what it was. I stepped backward, further into the lights, but it did as well, which meant it was moving further away, and as it moved, I saw it smile, revealing white, sharp, abnormal-looking teeth before disappearing into the dark. I didn't know what to do or say then, but I was so shocked and creeped out that I ran. I was already out of energy, but I ran anyway. My grandma's house was closer to anyone else's that I knew of, but her place was still about five houses down. Adrenaline kicked in, and after looking back one more time and seeing nothing, I started to run. But then... I heard the sound of flapping wings above me. Something massive was just overhead, following me, just as that figure did before. 
and I couldn't help but think that they were one and the same. By the time I made it to my grandma's driveway, I was exhausted, stomping my heavy feet up the pavement. Eventually, my scared grandma opened the door after I was knocking like a madman. When she saw me, she was relieved for a moment. I think she assumed I was on something. Yet, sadly, I was completely sober. I let her know what happened, that something scary and unexplainable was following me. She let me in as I explained. As we sat in her living room, discussing what was going on, we suddenly stopped because someone walked up the front steps of her porch. They stopped at the door, but never knocked, never rang the doorbell. They simply stood there, probably listening. After a while, we just turned on the TV, using the noise and the images to distract us. Plus, deep down, I didn't want it to know that I knew it was there. The next day, my grandma called my mother and told them to never let me out too late again and to avoid letting me out by myself whenever possible. To this day, I still don't know what or how all that happened. Whatever it was truly wasn't human, and I think it tried to take me. The Thing That Chased Us from V. This happened in Ontario, Canada, to my friends and I. When my friends and I were in grade 9, we used to go into a forest next to our old elementary school to hang out. We would dirt bike, build forts, play card games, drink and climb trees. The usual teenage stuff. The day this happened, we were climbing trees, seeing how far we dared to climb up the dead trees, then jump down, all while praying that we didn't break our necks. Yeah, we were weird, even reckless. One of my braver friends, C, decided it would be a smart idea to climb up a dead tree that was leaning against another tree to see if he could get to the top. My other friend, Leon, and I decided that we did not have a death wish like he did, so we stayed perched on another dead tree watching our idiot friend. Now, I want to say that I've always gotten these strange feelings about things. I practice Wicca, and I'm personally a witch of Draconic Wicca, but the point is, I get these feelings. They are like warnings when something is about to happen, when something supernatural is nearby, when we're in danger. Call it a sixth sense. I'm the firstborn female of a firstborn female and so on. I'm the seventh firstborn female in the generation, which makes for a very female-dominated family tree. But we believe seven is a powerful number, similar to the number six in Christianity. The seventh witch, which is myself, has the strongest connection to the supernatural on par with the first witch who started the generation, my really great grandmother. I'm called a high priestess, the reincarnation of my grandmother's mother, which only makes these feelings stronger and more absolute. Now, I know everything I just explained doesn't sound real. As fake as witches who fly on broomsticks and crowd around a black cauldron saying bubble bubble toil and trouble is, I didn't believe it at first either. Anyway, while C was climbing further up the tree, one of these feelings came over me, like someone brushing a feather down my back. It was telling me that my friends and I were in danger, which was odd. It was when I was pondering the strangeness of my feeling C disappeared into the canopy of the tree, and Leon and I lost sight of him. V, I remember Leon saying to me, something's not right. The air is stale, the birds are quiet, something feels wrong. It took me a minute, but he was right. There was a sinking feeling in my stomach as I looked around. Everything was still. Then that feeling against my back returned followed by a tingling sensation against my pocket. To my relief, it wasn't a claw trying to get at my wallet, it was just my phone. As every impulsive teenager who lives off their device does, I pulled out my phone, saw that it was a message, and opened it. It was from my Wiccan friend, Red, 
and it simply said, you need to leave now. I was taken aback. I knew that Red was quite intuitive. They practiced spiritual Wicca and were very in tune with the elements. This confirmed my suspicion that something was wrong. I responded, what do you mean? She confessed, I had sent a protection spell with you and felt that you were in danger. I still feel it. Where are you? Although I was flattered that Red had cared enough to spiritually stalk me, I was still somewhat suspicious. I remember looking around. They didn't live near me, so I was getting a little worried how they knew about our situation. Maybe she was right. So I replied, I'm at the park in the old forest. Leave, they told me. It's not safe right now. At this point, I was super glued to my phone. I had lost track of C and was completely immersed in this conversation. When suddenly, I was pulled from my device's grip when Leon and I heard a loud thud. It was the breaking of branches and something landing in the bushes about maybe 15 meters away. I nearly fell off the tree I was sitting on. I was so spooked. My shock was only dampened when I saw C sprinting, cuts all over his arms and legs from falling into the bush, pale as a ghost and terrified. Get out of that freaking tree! Now! He called up to us. Leon looked puzzled, but I could see anxiety bubbling as he looked at C. Well, don't just stand there, C demanded with fearful irritation in his tone. We need to get out of here. Why? Leon called while beginning to slowly shimmy down the trunk of the tree. There's, there's something here, C breathed, glancing back in the direction he came from. Crap, C cussed as he began to move away. Leon moved fast down the tree, but I was frozen. My phone was buzzing in my hand as messages from Red poured in, their warnings falling on deaf ears as I saw a dark, hairy shape hidden in the green ferns. Something smelled off, and my heart lurched as I saw it twitch in our direction. For a moment, I swear to God we made eye contact. And just as it began to move towards us, C grabbed me by the ankles and hauled me down the tree and to the ground. Quickly, I scrambled to my feet as I heard twigs breaking and branches being pushed out of the way. Out of fear, we all bolted as fast as we could. We thundered over thorny ankle-biting bushes, broke branches, and ran through many spider webs to get out of the forest. But when we got out, we were trapped. Where I live, the park and the forest are right next to a beach, which is a decent 10 meter drop, and there was no way in heck we were going to freaking swim to safety or hide by the rocks at the beach. M my grandma's house, Leon panted as we all sprinted down the trail towards civilization. It's the closest. There were no objections. We were all too scared to think of a decent plan. I felt my lungs burn for air as I pushed to keep up with my more athletic friends. I was never lazy, but I was no spring chicken. I am and always will be a short distance runner. So when I felt my pace begin to slow, I pushed even harder. Fearing for your life can make you do amazing things. We raced into Leon's grandmother's property. We all knew that she was snowbirding in Florida and would be away for the remainder of the cold months. We scrambled to the back door, which thankfully Leon had the spare key to, and we tumbled over each other to get inside. Now, we've seen horror films, and we thought we knew the best way to survive them. Number one on that survival list was to lock down the house, so we bolted to every door to lock it, as well as every window. It was in that time that I finally acknowledged my phone again. I had missed several texts from Red, and a few calls from them too, so I called back. Thank God, V, you're alive, they said. What happened? Are you okay? I explained everything to Red in as much detail as I could muster at the time. I was shaking both from overexertion and adrenaline, and after thinking about it, Red surprised me again. Get all the candles in the house and put them at every entrance to the house. Just trust me. C interjected. 
But your grandma doesn't have many candles. He had clearly crashed here many times before when he got drunk at a party and needed a place to be hung over at. Leon's grandma was a sweet old lady after all. There's the herb garden, Leon suggested. Perfect, said Red. Go get all the sage you can find then. And as if instructed by a general, Leon did so without complaint, returning with enough to make a small shrubbery out of the sage. Then we locked down the door and went upstairs to hide in the office. There was only one window and one door there, plus that door locked, so we figured it'd be safe. But for my personal safety, I decided to have the boys stay nearest to the door. I'd sooner jump out of a window that is two stories in the air before I let myself become dinner. Then again, we had no idea what was chasing us. Once we were huddled into the office, I hung up the phone with Red, and we took a moment to breathe. The hell was it? Z asked, his voice barely hovering above a whisper. I don't know, Leon responded. It felt like a monster from a horror film. Or maybe it was some drug-addicted psychopath who was broke and looking for some fresh teenagers to sell in the black market so he could buy more drugs, I stated with an irritated amount of sarcasm. I was starting to get frustrated at this point. What if this was some elaborate prank? What if some jerk had decided to dress up as Bigfoot and wait in the tree line for a while to send some unsuspecting passers-by into the afterlife for a laugh? Then we all froze. Something had opened the back gate and closed it. We stayed as silent as a church when we heard heavy footsteps against the garden path in the backyard and then we heard the distinct sound of jiggling doorknobs, the sound of something touching the windows. Whatever was stalking us was looking for us and was checking every entrance in the house to get inside. I knew it, I thought to myself. It's some murderer, and we're about to be killed. Guys? Leon whispered, cutting through my pessimistic thoughts. What? I responded. Who locked the basement door? My heart sank as we looked at each other, all silently admitting that it wasn't us. I had been too nervous to go to the basement, but it was the same for them. No one locked it, I said, my throat dry as we realized that that thing had an opening. Crap, said C. Someone needs to lock it. Are you out of your mind? growled Leon. If one goes, we all go, I stated, quietly getting up. No point in getting separated. We stand a better chance as a team than we do on our own. Reluctantly, the boys and I grabbed nearby objects and quietly crept out of the office. I had grabbed a broom that was hanging on the hook by the door. Leon had a combat stapler, I guess, and C had a mail opener. We heard the thing move to the front of the house at that point, so we hurried to get to the basement. Carefully, we tried our best to sneak down the old wooden stairs. I used that old trick I'd used to sneak downstairs of the house when my parents were watching TV, so I could sneak some sweets, clinging to the edge of the wall. Once we got to the cold basement, we were huddled together, moving as quickly as a bunch of scared teenagers could, toward the door. The way the basement was set up was like this. There's the staircase leading to an open room surrounded by doors to the boiler and storage room, with an air hockey table in the center of the room leading to the movie room where a couch was and the door just around the corner. We were trying to be stealthy when the boiler turned on, spooking Leon, who instinctively jumped, going right into the air hockey table and letting the plastic puck hit the floor. Then we all froze. Although the sound was small, it felt as loud as a fire alarm, and we strained our ears to hear. Quickly, we heard footsteps coming towards the door. Crap, I huffed as I darted from the huddle towards the door. I saw a shadow swiftly dart behind the curtains of the window nearing the door. My heart was pounding. I put my hand forward and prayed under my breath, hoping that I would be faster, hoping that I would make it to the door first. My shoulder collided with the door as I fumbled against the knob to lock it. As soon as I did, I felt an equal thud on the other end of the door, and a loud growl. 
I basically flew away from the door and into the arms of my friends, who were standing in horror. Through the glass window of the door and the floral white mini curtains, we saw a shadow, large, covered in hair or fur. Its shoulders were at the midpoint of the window. It was taller than the door, and it growled like a dog would when you kept its bone away from it. I rose to my feet shakily, and I stared at the shadow as I felt it stared right back at me. Leave, I remember commanding under my breath as I felt a surge of electricity go through me. Maybe it was adrenaline, or something else, but it soon growled one more time, and then thudded away, its heavy footsteps soon fading. We heard every single agonizing step, though, up the stairs, through the gate. As soon as we could breathe, we bolted back upstairs in the house and to the office again, calling our parents. We were still teenagers, and there was no way in hell we were going outside. When my mother came to get me, to her reluctance, she said to me that she felt something was there around the house, something evil and dangerous, and I had told her nothing, only that I had hurt my ankle falling from a tree. That was all the confirmation I needed. I knew that feeling I had was right, and to this day I trust my sixth sense. I advise you all to do the same. The next time you feel yourself being stalked by something sinister, light a candle, grab some sage. It may sound silly, but it might just save you. Well, there you have it. These monsters may be spooky. They may look fearsome and come running right at you. But then again, they are Canadian. They're probably just offering you a seat at their dinner table and a warm bed to stay in for the night. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have your own story, share it with us at darkstories.org. Before we go, be sure to check the links in the description for links to donate and to get some merch. Now, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They're awesome people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.